Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. It is The Savage Nation, don't worry about it. It's Monday morning. What do you want me to do, set the world on fire? Has Rush Limbaugh become the Oprah Winfrey of the Republican Party? Don't call me on that one. It just entered my mind. I am so sick and tired of listening to the radio and hearing the Republicans are the answer to the Republic's problems. I'm sick of it, and I'm not going to buy it anymore. I carved out the independent conservative niche for myself 15 or 16 years ago, and all I hear is Republican going to save the world. Republicans are good. Democrats are bad. Republicans are the answer. Ronald Reagan is God. I'm sick of it. It's all bull crap. So I'm not going to talk about it. Instead, I'm going to talk about Mad Men, the final episode. I'm going to talk about Al Sharpton's daughter twisting an ankle and suing for four and a half million dollars and then being seen hiking, I don't know, in a mountaintop in the Himalayas. Man, that apple don't fall far from the rotten tree. But in this case, not the apples are rotten, but the tree is rotten. How does this man get away with it? But look at the progeny he produces. Okay, that's number two. Number three. The real Fidel Castro. I know the Pope loves Fidel, the communist dictator drug dealer, according to a new book that just came out from a man who was Fidel's bodyguard for 17 years. Did you hear what I said? Not written by a liberal. Fidel Castro's bodyguard for 17 years, who was thrown in jail by that rat, wrote a book about the real Fidel Castro, and he says he was a drug dealer and a miserable, mean, evil dictator. That's the new friend of the Pope. That's the man that Obama opened up new channels with. And you morons think it's wonderful, that it's very progressive. That's topic four. That's four. Number five. I read over the weekend, I saw that uh, the uh, Delta Force, haven't heard of them for a while, I guess the special forces were getting too much credit. But apparently the Army wanted to get in on the action with the Delta Force. And they, uh, the great Barack Obama in between uh, looking for the putt and the hole and the ball, directed a, an attack on Abu Sayyaf, a key ISIS figure, and allegedly he was killed and his wife was captured, and all of our troops came home safely. Isn't that nice? They got intelligence on how the terror organization operates, communicates and earns money, and all of our men in the Delta Force came home safely. Not so much as a scratch. Well, I have a question for you. Is it propaganda? Because... Just a day before we read that another city had been overrun by Obama's JV team, ISIS. The next day we hear Delta Force does a miraculous raid like this, and every schmuck in the media is all over. Yay! The great commander-in-chief, Obama, has done it again. Why are there no pictures? Must I eat it? Take it whole? Swallow it whole? Must I believe everything the government media complex puts out? I have no way of knowing whether Delta Force did this to you. It could be Capricorn 1 for all I know. Topic number six. I've given you six topics. Has Rush Limbaugh become the Oprah Winfrey of the Republican Party? Is Al Sharpton's daughter a twin for the evil father? The Mad Men final episode. My book, Countdown to Mecca, some bookstore stories. The real Fidel, Fidel Castro, according to his bodyguard of 17 years. Do you believe the U.S. Army Delta Force really killed the ISIS leader? Now, if that's not enough for you, I got a little bit more. But before we go into a little bit more, and it's a new contest I'm running. That's right. You can go to michaelsavage.com and see what I'm doing. No one has done this in the history of radio, what I'm about to do. I'm, I'm forever reinventing stuff for the radio show. Every day, all I do is think about the show and how to make it more adventurous than the day before. So I've created something I think you're going to like, and it's, it's uh, interactive. It's actually an interactive thing that I've created for you, the listener. I want to play the sound to Mad Men for a moment on the Savage Nation. It's a series on A&E that ended. Love it. Love the opening. Now, I, I've been captivated by this show from the beginning. I loved it for many years, and I didn't like it. I liked it best when January Jones was a skinny 
vampy twin for some of the great, let's say, sirens in the history of film. Once they turned her into a sow living in Westchester with a, a Republican uh, congressman, or I don't know what he was, a, a attorney general, I don't know what, I, don't, I lost interest in her when she became fat and sat in the house. Okay, and I liked when she was in the house originally with Don, with the two children. It was the original America that we all grew up with, the little New York, uh, you know, the dream of America. Mother, father, children, house, picket fence. And what really went on? I mean, he was a runaround lunatic. The seventh season ended last night. Some say it was among the best in TV history. I wouldn't say so. The Sopranos are still number one. Of course, many of the same incredible uh, <clears throat> film people who created The Sopranos created Mad Men, in case you don't know that. Matthew Weiner, for example, used to write many of the episodes of The Sopranos. Many of the cinematographers, producers, directors who worked on The Sopranos worked on this, and I saw overlap like a dance scene last night of a guy of them skating through an empty house. Okay, fine. Let's say it was one of the best TV shows in history. But what is it really about? Well, for those of you who watched it, you know what it's about. Mad Men is not just the story of Don Draper and January Jones's character. It, Don was a womanizing ad exec. He couldn't keep his hand off any woman, no matter who it was. Uh, soccer team of the daughter, uh, babysitter neighbor the guy was an all-around db and he has a, a a hidden past changed his name shot his commanding officer in korea you know horrible background good looking uh, ad man like uh, ad man type of uh, madison avenue but what the show is really about is the weird transformation that america went through in the 1960s that's the real story of the show it's why many of us were captivated by it because we've lived through it we went from the 1950s where things were stable, America was all powerful, we had Pax Americana, everything was American, everyone wanted to be in America. All of a sudden, the degenerates like Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, and the lawyer, the lawyer who went down south to run the, uh, the uh, anti-racism marches, I forget the lawyer's name, the three of them, plus a few of the uh, early feminists, Betty Friedan and the other DBs, uh, delayed broadcasters, they destroyed America. They single-handedly destroyed America. And our post-war optimism went to pot. Marijuana had a big, big, big role in the destruction of America, as it is right now. And everybody lost their minds. The whole country lost their minds. Everyone became crazy. Dark decade, civil unrest, mustaches, bell bottoms, uh, underarm hair for women, patchouli oil, uh, STDs became rampant. And so last night it ended, the, the show ended. And it ends with him at Esalen. <laughs> For those of you who didn't know the setting, it was up in Mater uh, uh, Carmel area on a bluff with everyone going ohm and sitting around with the phony guru and all of that. And Don had run away from the ad business, as many people in the ad business did in, the, in that era. They all were running away. They wanted to find themselves and write the great novel. Some of them did. Most of them didn't. Uh, Don goes to the cliffside and he does ohm and he meditates. He finds himself. He starts to cry on another man's arm. I thought I was going to end in a gay scene with him running off with the bald guy, frankly. I was thanking God it didn't. When he hugged the bald guy, I was crying. I said, oh, God, no, please. Matthew, don't do this to us. But no, no, it ends with the Coca-Cola ad. We are the world. So you're supposed to believe that after Don, who ran away from advertising, gave away his Cadillac to a bum hitchhiking on the road and finds himself in Essel and crying on a bald guy's shoulder. After Don finds himself with to believe he goes back to Madison Avenue with the greatest new campaign in history for Coca-Cola called We Are the World. In other words, he co-opted the hippie movement. That's, uh, you know, that's the subtext of it. But what do, you, what do you think about Mad Men? Did anyone watch it? Am I talking about something you'd rather not hear about? The news out there is so horrendous right now that I can do that in a few minutes. And as well as that, when I return, I have a new contest I've created for my listeners that you can preview on michaelsavage.com right beneath the book ad for Countdown to Mecca. So let me introduce my questions for listeners and give you my phone number, which is 855-400-7282. I've given you five, six, seven, eight topics. You can call on any one of those. And while you're doing that, here are some of the questions for the listeners, and I'm going to read it to you. I wrote it last night. On the Savage Nation, we talk a lot about the problems facing America. 
Well, it's time to get serious about the solutions. How do we get from where we are today to true representative government? How do we stop the progressive Islamist takeover and reestablish our borders, language, and culture? Now, I've told you some of my solutions over the months and years I've been on the radio. Now I'd like to hear yours. Would you like to see your name in print in a new Michael Savage book? Then give me your answers to some of these tough questions that I ask every day on the Savage Nation. If we select your answer, we'll publish it as part of my most groundbreaking I'm sorry, my, my most groundbreaking book yet. Email your answers to savageanswer at gmail.com. Savageanswer at gmail.com. Savageanswer at gmail.com. Please limit your answers to 250 words per question. And there are 13 questions about how to save America. I'll read you one of them right now. Take a break. Come back to all this and more right here on the Savage Nation. Question one for the contest. With the state of the republic right now, what do you think are the main elements of a solution to our unresponsive government? Is it electoral, constitutional, grassroots, local politics, or 700 hell's angels? I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. So that's the theme song to the uh, seven-year hit series Mad Men, which just ended last night on on A and E, I believe. And A and E is a low grade AMC, sorry, is a low grade uh, cable uh, channel. Uh, this full of ads, which I'll tell you the truth, the ads can drive you insane. Last night was a disgrace. Matthew Weiner should be given a a goat's head for what he did. Three minutes of a show and two minutes of ads. I couldn't take it. It's disgusting. But all right, whatever. I have ads too. What can you do? You have to pay your bills. But if you go to cable, I mean, you're paying for it. Why do I have to, why do I have to pay uh, for ads? Here, you, you don't pay for anything for my show, so I need ads. There, you're paying cable. Anyway, music, 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 music. Mad Men, the themes, the songs. Well, I understand they were selected by renowned music supervisor Alexandra Patsavis, and they set the tone for the entire series. And what is the theme of Mad Men, and why should you listen to this? What, what was the appeal of that? It's basically about the loss of innocence of individuals and America and the downward fall of its main characters. Isn't it about that? So in the beginning, uh, early years of the show, heavy on popular jazz, crooners, standards, youth culture, rock and roll burst onto the scene later on with Chubby Checkers, Let's Twist, and Let's Twist Again. That ushered in season two. Then there was another cultural sea change, the arrival of psychedelia, um, LSD, psilocybin, mushrooms, uh, marijuana, symbolized in episode eight of season five of the Beatles. And uh, on and on. So music is a very big part of, of the show. Diverse music selection, and it really is important to understand that. As much as it was important in The Sopranos, and as a, music is important to my show, incidentally, I would say Michael Savage's talk show it has music as a central theme behind the scene there's music i send messages through my music did you know that like today i didn't open with what do i normally open with on monday that's a five second question what is it blue monday fats domino 20 years i did that for blue monday. bingo but we're not doing it see that's the downbeat you're used to instead i open with this let's play the one i opened with today in case you missed it and if we can you're as cold as ice you're willing to sacrifice our love beautiful song Beautiful song. I'm, I'm the uh, music supervisor of the Savage Nation. <laughs> Depending on what I want to listen to, I play. I love it. The music makes me happy. It makes me sad. It gets me up. It throws me down. But nevertheless, here we are. Are there any ad men listening to this show who wore ad men in the 60s, who watched them ad men, who now listen only to Michael Savage because I'm the person you've always wanted to be? Can you imagine if you had left advertising, went to Esalen, became a hippie, grew your hair, became a hippie, found yourself, and then became an herbalist, traveled the islands, etc., and then wound up on radio later on in life, pontificating and making a good living at it. Uh, that, that's really an, an interesting, that's a trajectory of my life in some ways. I never went to Esalen, by the way. I knew it was phony from the beginning. 
I mean, I live in the Bay Area. I knew a lot of people that went up and down to Esalen and they went into these seminars. I knew they were all frauds, basically. They would stab you in the back before you could say Mickey Jager. So I never went to Esalen, but I was around the area of the frauds who went to Esalen, taught at Esalen, did at Esalen, Schmesselen, at Kessel Esalen, Esalen. Are there any Essels out there? Esalen types who went down there and found themselves and realized it was all a fraud that all the hippies really wanted to do was steal your old lady and rob your drugs. The whole hippie movement was allegedly about a new America and peace and love, but really all they wanted to do was steal your old lady and steal your drugs. And by the way, if they could, they'd steal your stereo on the way out the door. That's with the long hair and the big smiles. That's California in a nutshell. I love it here for that reason, because no one ever got my old lady, nor my stereo, nor my drugs for three reasons. Uh, one, I don't use drugs. Two, no one could come near the other two things because I had a little friend in the doorway called Mr. Smith and his good friend Wesson. And that was the Wesson cooking oil. So I'm asking you a question. Are there any ad men out there who lived through the era of Mad Men, who then went on in life and really did something else with your life, who listened to this show, and why do you listen to the show? And don't you really wish you were me? Because you do. So what's the real appeal of Mad Men? Gene on KSFO. God, I got the callers. Couldn't find the book in Tampa. Strand Bookstore in New York City doesn't carry the book. Don Draper this. Nothing impending your genius book. Stop the coming civil war. No, Obama's working towards it. He's taken away military equipment from the local police. And he's militarized the military in America. Hello? Any other questions about the fraud gangster regime in the White House, the criminals stirring up hatred in the inner cities with the unemployed blacks? Attacking the cops? That's in the middle of Mad Men. In case you were waiting for something quiet, you just got it. You don't see what the gangster is doing, do you? The smooth gangster without Sharpton. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Let me repeat the question because I don't think anyone heard me. I'm getting only calls. The only calls I'm getting on this sterling broadcast of mine, which I don't mind, I like it, is on Mad Men. And I don't blame people. They don't want to talk about Sharpton's daughter twisting her ankle and suing the city for four and a half million dollars and then showing herself on top of a mountain after a hike. She's probably using the same filthy, dirty lawyer that Sharpton used to, to rip the, system, the city off for all these years. And then I asked about uh, the real Fidel Castro, which I haven't gotten to yet, written by his bodyguard, the double life of Fidel Castro. It's astounding to me the kind of propaganda in this country and how it is very similar to the propaganda Fidel controlled in his country. Obama and Fidel have almost one thing in common for sure. And that's not the same last name, nor the country of birth. What they have in common is the ability to control their image. Fidel Castro and Barack Obama both have armies of image controllers that put out propaganda day and night. Question number 15. Were you able to find Countdown to Mecca in the bookstores? Question number 16. Do you believe the cover story that the U.S. Army Delta Force uh, caught a top ISIS figure, ca uh, killed him, captured his wife, and got lots of intelligence, and all the men returned safely without a scratch. And that President Obama directed it himself from the war room. I mean, if I were writing a bad script, it would be this script. Until I see the pictures, I don't accept it. I think it's a bunch of garbage. How's that? Now, I may see the pictures by the end of the day, because I'm doubting them now. And you'll start doubting them. And you'll say, hey, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, we haven't seen any pictures of that raid. How come? Hey, yeah, hey, hey, Rube. Hey, Rube, have a come. We haven't seen no pictures of that Delta Force raid that the media's been reporting. They must have had, to, someone must have taken a picture there when they pulled, uh, pulled out the wife in the hijab and the, the intelligence. Where's the picture? Why aren't we seeing the pictures? I guess they haven't, I guess Hollywood was busy this week and they couldn't put it together. They were all in con. So since Weinstein and company were in con, I guess they got to wait till they're back. Uh, from the film uh, show uh, to, to create the movie for Obama called Delta Force Raid under the great commandante uh, Barack Obama. WFTL in Florida. Go ahead, please, Rudy. What's on your mind? Well, I was a mad woman, not a mad man on Madison Avenue in uh, 1950. I graduated college in 1950, and that was my first job. Uh, which company did you work for, Young and Rubicon? 
Right, yeah. It's one of the uh, uh, how how high up did you go on the on the corporate ladder? I started my basic salary was forty dollars a week. <laughs> no, no. Days. I'm saying, what job did you have at the end? What position? Oh, I I was uh, um, one of the most minor uh, copywriters on staff. Uh, and was it very much presented as it was in Mad Men? Oh, it was really bad. It was. It, I think it was even worse. <laughs> what you mean? The women were treated like uh, like a chorus line. No, I, I not especially. I think the, the sexual aspect of it was really, really quite something. I was a, a babe in arms when I got out of school, and to be thrown into this atmosphere was really quite. Well, that's what I'm saying. You were treated like a trinket, like some a member of a chorus line that the men just went after, right? Well, I don't know if it was me. It was most of the other girls because I was only 21 when I when I started working. Well, how old were they? 15? What do you mean the other girls? How, were they older or younger? Oh, they were much older than me. Okay. Well, thanks for the call. I couldn't get anywhere with that. Nice to hear. I have a diverse audience. That's good. Very nice. Very good. Very good. Very good. I uh, I could never work in advertising. I knew one guy who went into advertising. Honestly, in my circle, no one went into advertising. I... It was considered a flaky field, by the way. That was very beneath most of the people I knew. It's not like they, you know, they went to Madison Avenue. We knew right away the phoniest of us would go there. In other words, the guys who didn't need a nose job worked in Madison Avenue. The guys who were over five foot ten worked in Madison Avenue. The guys who who looked good but couldn't go to law school or medical school or God forbid dental school, they went into advertising, but no one else did. WABC, Peter, welcome to, to the Savage Nation. Sometimes I get a reverberation of my own humor. I laugh. I do it for me. If you don't like it, it's too bad. What's on your mind? Hi, Dr. Savage. Well, I thought that change, that uh, transformation was very uncharacteristic for Don Draper because if you remember in season five, his wife leaves uh, the actress he was married to. She leaves and she says, listen to the last song on the Revolver album, you know, the psychedelic one. He couldn't handle it. He had to, like, take it off. You know, he had no... He had none of that sensibility of that new age hippie movement. All right, so what? The wife left him because he was too stiff? No, he was a runaround. He was a cheat. No, no, no. We're talking about the actress, his second wife. She says she leaves the apartment. She says, "Oh, wait, wait, wait. Well, you're talking about the young one that he marries, the black haired girl, the dark haired girl." Yes, that's what I'm talking okay, about. Okay, so she leaves him. Why? Because oh, she's swinging. She's cool. She's into into the whole drug scene uh, that's emerging in New York, and he can't make that move. Is that what you're saying? Well, he's listening to the song, and then he takes it off of the record, because he's not like Roger Sterling, who did LSD. But then he winds up in, in Esalon, and he has one ohm, gives him more enlightenment than all the, uh, the wheat, grass, and tofu that hippies could have eaten in 20 years. I mean, the guy just came to himself. You know, after he hugged that guy, he realized he really felt his, that guy's pain. He had a real Bill Clinton moment. You know, he felt he... So you really like the series. I mean, you're really into it. I can hear by what you're saying. You got into it. I loved it. Yeah. See, Don, did you did you go through the hippie era? From did you yourself go through that long haired, touchy feely, huggy huggy phase of your life? <laughs> I wasn't touchy feely. I was more like a, a rock and roller during that period. But yeah, <laughs> no. But you remember the touchy feely phase? You remember the kind of guys that did that? Yep. Yep. I yeah. I knew a couple of creeps like that that they would hug women, but they really just wanted to feel their breasts against their chest. Yeah, they'd always squeeze women. They always squeeze the women very hard, even though their their loins were pressed backwards so as not to show any sexual intent. They were really squeezing to get the uh, woman's, you know what, pressed against them. They were the sickest. One of them became a doctor who went to work for Kaiser uh, in San Francisco because he actually couldn't get any women. But that that's a side story. No, I know there was always that type, the, the phone. Did you ever get stabbed in the back by any of those New Age hippies? Well, I went to some of those seminars and got stabbed in the back, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. What, what city did you go to them in? Uh, California, when I lived out there, yeah. Where, where were you, San Francisco, L.A.? Which city? L.A., L.A., yeah. I used to do a lot of uh, that stuff uh, because I was searching, but uh, it was all... All right, wait, hold it. This is an interesting story. We were all searching for ourselves, as young people do. We were misled by the devils who ran this hippie movement. Timothy Leary pushed drugs. Allen Ginsberg pushed 
a false sense of sexuality down everyone's throat. The women's movement pushed a big lie on everyone. So as a result of all of that, the country fragmented and broke down right down the middle. And as a result, we have Barack Obama. Uh, the sin qua non of the entire 60s movement is Barack Obama. Had there not been a 60s, this character couldn't run a funeral parlor in Duluth. I agree. Yeah, he was the kind of guy that if you were smoking pot with him in the '60s, and he and he was and he had the joint, and he said, "Hey, one day I'm going to be president." We'd all laugh and say, "Yeah, right." But you know, Ginsburg was the worst. He said, "I'm going to get your children." And that's what we're going to go after. And if you look at it, that's exactly what they did. They did it through the university. They got the kids. Well, Timothy Leary pushed LSD as though it was a, a household cleanser. He poisoned the minds of millions. And the reason he was able to do it more successfully than other drug peddlers was because he was from Harvard, he was a psychologist, and he had this high-class so-called waspy look. So everyone figured if he said LSD is God's gift to man, it must be right. That's what happened. Then you had this degenerate Allen Ginsberg who looked like a Jewish rabbi, but he was a perverted Satan in reverse. He made everyone think he was rabbinic and Talmudic, but he was the opposite of rabbis in the Talmud. So he poisoned the soul of man. Then you had the women, basically who hated men, who pushed the woman's movement. They were the Satans of their time. And as a result of this triumvirate of evil, we have Barack Obama, 30, 40 years later. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's pretty much it. When are you going to write that book? That's going to be no, no, did you see that global picture I just painted? I'm serious. I, I have thought about this for 30 years now. How did we get to the point that a man as fraudulent, as anti-American as Obama can get away with this? How does he get away with it every day? And how does he raise the stakes of this, of this incredible deceit with the people not seeing it? And the answer is, really, you have to look backwards to know where we're at today. Yeah, you do. And the 60s was really a change. In our it was a horrible time. You know, people look back and think that the 60s were a lot of fun. It was a horrible, horrible time. It was filled with frauds and phonies, most of whom are running the world right now. What do you do today, Peter? What do you do today after all those years of searching? How'd you end up? Well, uh, I, I, uh, I made a 180. I went back to my Catholic faith because I realized if I wanted mysticism, that's where I was going to find it. Bingo. Absolutely. Mysticism is found in all religions, incidentally. Yeah, but like the things yeah, we could spend a whole show on the mysticism and Catholicism, which is fabulous, full of rituals, full of symbolism and full of mysticism. People don't see that. They see it as a rigid religion. They don't understand it any more than they understand true Judaism. Judaism in America is presented as a sort of bagels and locks, social gathering with a rabbi who has no spirituality. He's just doing stale Woody Allen routines, you know, driving a, a car given to him by the congregation. And there's no spirit there. There's no spirituality. The same thing in the popular imagery of churches today, but there is a, a, a an absolute uh, mystical element to both of the religions I just mentioned. Oh, Judaism is full of it. First, the mysticism that they pull out of the first five books of the of the uh, the Bible is just it's, you could spend a lifetime studying that. That's correct. And but see, modern liberal reform Jews don't know any of that. They're afraid of it. They reject it. The Orthodox Jews, as flawed as they are, and as crazy as some of them are, are actually the link to that element of Judaism, which is the core of it. The Kabbalah, for the Kabbalah, for example. I mean, Madonna knows from the Kabbalah like my dog knows from a refrigerator. All she knows how to do is all she knows how to do is open the refrigerator, but she didn't build a refrigerator. The same thing with Madonna and the phonies in Hollywood who embraced Kabbalah. They know how to open the door, but they don't know what they're looking at because the light's out. Well, Look, I could go on and on about this and get very philosophical and be right on target. I'm going to send you a copy of Countdown to Mecca because this is something every ad man in the history of America has ever dreamed of doing, is leaving advertising and writing the great American novel. Well, I, Michael Savage, have written three of them. One is called Abuse of Power, six weeks on the New York Times list, but you haven't read about it because I'm not a liberal. The second in the series was called A Time for War, four to five weeks on the New York Times list, but you haven't read about it because I'm not a liberal. The third came out last Tuesday, but you haven't heard about it. It's the last in the series. It's called Countdown to Mecca, but you will hear about it because I'm making you hear about it right now. It's that simple. 855-407-282. 855-407-282. There are so many other topics. So let me go to question two of the questions I posted on my website of questions for listeners. With neither party representing the people, does the solution for conservatives lie in working within the Republican Party or in a new third party? Question three. 
The two parties have achieved a stranglehold over the electoral system, which makes it difficult for any third party to get traction. How can that be changed when all the legislators are in the club we're trying to break up? Uh, six, and these are questions, if you want to write the answers to them by email, you can do so by going to uh, savageanswer at gmail.com and see if you can win the prize. And I'll just read this one. What is the solution to immigration changing American culture? Even with different immigration policies, is it inevitable that American culture will change with demographics over time? How can we make that a positive rather than a negative? Do you notice what I just did there? How can we make that a positive rather than a negative? In other words, you can scream from today until tomorrow that you want them all deported. You can scream all you want, but you know that's not happening. That's the absolutist position. It is not going to happen. How can we make what is happening a positive rather than a negative? How can we control the tide that is sweeping over America? I have many answers to that question, which I'm going to deal with, you know, in, in time. But if you want to take a shot at that in a short, you know, uh, version, you can go to my website, look at the questions and send the answers. And eventually, if I like them, I'll include them as listeners sent by my uh, answers sent by my listeners to these very important questions. Because you know what I thought of? As I'm promoting, listen to this, as I'm promoting Countdown to Mecca, I'm finishing up a sequel to Stop the Coming Civil War for uh, the Hachette group. So I'm always, I always got a chicken on the spit. I always have a chicken on the spit. I'm working, always working. I'm working on my journal book. I'm working on that. But the next big book is, on, I'm under a lot of pressure right now. I'm under deadline pressure because that book's coming out in October. I've got to deliver that book in June. I am working around the clock on that book. People say, I don't know how you do it. Well, I do it because I do nothing else. But I've hit a stone wall with some of these questions because I can't answer them myself. And then it dawned on me just last night, wait a minute. I have the smartest audience in the media listening to the Savage Nation. The people who listen to my show are very thoughtful. Some of them are more thoughtful than others. So I said, what if I pose these incredible mind-bending questions on my audience and ask them to write solutions for the book, make it an interactive final chapter, and then give them something like, uh, you know, you can come on the show, you can read your answer on the show if you're picked, you'll certainly win a free book. But this may be the first interactive book I've ever written. Never before thought of. Uh, I thought of it because I realized that no man is an island. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Do, do women really love the dad bod? I saw this this morning. It says, for some, pudgy is the new male ideal. Uh, SF gate. They said the dad bod is not an overweight guy, but it isn't one with washboard abs either. They work out, but after going to the gym, they happily scarf down pizza and beer. In other words, the dad bod is more pop and fresh, less Michelin man. <laughs> and they say modern women don't want the competition of guys who have washboard abs. The dad bod is what they want. They want slightly pudgy. And they do a whole story on why women now like the dad bod. One, we don't need a perfectly sculpted guy standing next to us to make us feel worse about our bodies. Two, we want to look skinny. And the bigger the guy, the smaller we feel and the better we look next to you in a picture. <laughs> Softer bodies make better cuddlers. Pudgy guys, pay attention. Four, we know what we are getting into when he's got the same exact body type at the age of 22 that he's going to have at 45. <laughs> That's not true. I guarantee you, pudgy guy at 22 is a, a little portly at 45. <laughs> hey, here's another reason, though. Uh, pudgy guys make better lovers. That's right. A 2010 tur Turkish study concluded that men with protruding bellies last longer in bed than their thinner counterparts. Why? Chunkier guys have more of the female sex hormone estradiol in their bodies which slows down their orgasms. This is interesting. What can I tell you? It's as interesting as ISIS. In fact, it's more interesting than ISIS to me. At the end of the day, it's the pebble in the shoe. Do women really love the dad bod? Is pudgy the new male ideal? There's more. There's politics. But what's more political than sex? Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage.
Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. So look, I touched on a lot of topics in hour number one, from Mad Men's final show to my novel Countdown to Mecca to the real Fidel Castro. Do you really believe the U.S. Army Delta Force really killed the ISIS leader? If so, where are the pictures? Do women really love the dad bod? Is Pudgy the new male ideal? Uh, Etc. But there's many other stories I haven't touched on yet. Because they just hammer you with Republican this, Democrat that, blah, 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 blah. So those are the questions we've touched on. And I think we ought to now play the race baiter himself. Because the day wouldn't be complete unless you understood that while you were partying over the weekend or golfing, whatever you do, the devil in the White House was putting out more racial unrest and hatred uh, around the clock from his microphone deep in the bowels of the White House. Listen to what the divider in chief said in clip eight. That sense of unfairness and powerlessness has helped to fuel the kind of unrest that we've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson and New York. You liar. It has many causes, from a basic lack of opportunity to groups feeling unfairly targeted by police. See, again, the police are dying and he's saying to them, kill them again. You think I'm going to mince words? I'm not. This man is the devil. I'm convinced Obama is the devil. If there is a devil, let's put it to you this way. If there's a mythical devil, he's it. Smooth talk. He's Satan. The man may as well be Satan. Why do I say a thing like that on a national broadcast? Why? Because I believe it's true. But I don't actually believe there's a Satan. I believe that there's an evil, socialist, communist, anti-American, especially anti-European American man in the White House with a wife who's worse than he is. And I think that they do everything they can around the clock to foster hatred between the races. Moreover, I'll go a step further. How is it that a criminal like Al Sharpton, a degenerate race hater, Gunniff of the lowest order, who has a daughter who says she twisted her ankle and is suing New York for four and a half million dollars, and then she's filmed on top of a mountain hiking. How is it that that degenerate lowlife is invited into the White House 40 times and these empty suits in the, in the uh, media don't say a word? about Al Sharpton, a criminal, degenerate race hater, in my opinion, invited in and out of the White House. Forget what you think of Al Sharpton. I want you to imagine if a right-winger had won the presidency, and shortly after winning, he started inviting the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in and out of the White House for 50 times. Do you think think that George Staphylococcus would have let him get away with that? Do you think that George Staphylococcus, who's too glib to fail, would have not commented on the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan coming in and out of the White House had a conservative won the presidency? You betcha. Do you think that that phony Irishman, John McCain, would be sitting there like the phony he is day in and day out, peddling the military-industrial complex while doing nothing about ISIS? Do you think Nancy Pelosi who has capitalized on the unrest in America. Do you think Dianne Feinstein, who sits on a Senate Intelligence Committee, will be sitting like the Queen of Diamonds herself, capitalizing on the unrest in America, letting ISIS rage across the Middle East and get up there today like the Queen of Diamonds and say, oh, we must do something to stop ISIS like she just discovered it in the middle of selling as many products as she could around the globe. That's the opening to the show. And I'm not yet in a sweat. If you get a comment on any of these topics, the phone number is 855-407-282. It's only Monday. I don't mean to upset you. I mean to awaken you. And it's a funny thing. Of all these topics that I introduced in our number one, people are calling about two topics only, mainly. They're calling about uh, Mad Men 
And then they're calling about the dad bod. Because, look, it's the pebble in the shoe, television and uh, sex. That's what people are interested in. Now, I've known this for years, by the way, is that women really don't like macho warriors as much as you would think. It's what the uh, imagery in the television would have you believe. Number one, men who are into that body shape, you know, the perfect abs, and every minute they're looking at themselves and exercising, they're, co they're in competition with the woman, and she doesn't need another chick in the house. Uh, competing for mirror space. Let's put it to you that way. That doesn't mean she needs a blob running around, but we're talking about something in between. And then I read the article about the dad bod, why they're more uh, practical and less Darwinian. And they say we don't need a perfectly sculpted guy standing next to us to make us feel worse <laughs> about our bodies. Softer bodies make better cuddlers. And then they say uh, they're better lovers. See, the myth is, is that if you have abs, you're a better lover. But a 2010 Turkish study concluded that men with protruding bellies, maybe, maybe it's true in Turkey, last longer in bed than their thinner counterparts. Why? Chunkier, your guy, chunkier guys have more of the female sex hormone estradiol in their bodies, which slows down their orgasms. I, I didn't know any of this. Who knew? Who knew? But a lot of guys get frightened at age 30 because they think, oh, God, look at that. No matter what I do, there's a little belly fat. Oh, God, look at that, the gray hair. Oh, God, this, oh, God. Let it happen. You know what I'm saying? Do the best you can and stop eating your heart out already. First, you're not going to live forever. That's number one. And number two, you're not going to look like Adonis at 50. In fact, the harder you work out at 30, the worse you look at 60. I can, I can guarantee it. I can almost get, I'm not saying let, let it yourself go. Don't get me wrong. Don't become an archie bumper with a, with a tire on your gut. But there is some kind of balance somewhere, isn't it? So these are the topics. WJR. I have such good callers, God. WJR, Dave, welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Yeah, I work for one of the largest uh, advertising agencies in the world. And uh, I just want to give you a heads up on what's going on. Today, where I work, it makes Mad Men look like a cotton candy factory. Well, wait, you mean that they're more, they're more competitive with each other? Is that what you mean? Oh, God, no. It's nothing but a big party. Listen to this. At 3 o'clock, a bell actually sounds. That bell means the bar is open. They have craft service. They have a liquor license right here in our agency. All these out, just out of college tech heads run down there for their lunch hour come back to my department higher than kites. What do you mean? They're getting drunk on the job and the job is providing the liquor? Yes, because... Even in this day and age with the liability, you're telling me they're serving booze at work today? Yes. Basically, the answer I was given, our company is based out of Germany, and there's more of an acceptance of that in Germany. So... Yeah, but how can a person work when they, I never understood that in Mad Men, that every minute they say you want something, you want something, all that bars. You know, when I entered radio, there was a bar in, in a radio station that I worked at. That was common in the radio business as well. But how can an on-air personality ever have a drink and do a cogent show? It's impossible. So the same applies to how can you write anything if you're, if you're drunk? Let, let, me do, let me do something real quick. I was just going to shut my door here. And I'm going to tell you what I'm looking at. Okay, Go ahead. I'm the, super, I'm the supervisor over 25, I call them tech heads, but actually our department is called the Swarm. And what, what they do is basically uh, the music and the publishing rights to um, one of our clients is one of the biggest automobile companies in the world. That's why we're based here in Dearborn, Michigan. Yeah, well, I want I want that client on my show, and they won't advertise. Do you know, by the way, none of the car companies will advertise on my show, even though my show has most of the drivers of the kind of cars that they sell. They won't advertise because the agencies are run by progressive, left-wing, fanatic, Islamist liberals. If you let me describe the scene I'm looking at, our place is so liberal it makes me sick. Okay, over here in the back corner... I got I call I got a, I call her taboo because she's got so many tattoos on her that I can't figure out whether she's a, a man or a woman. 
Now, please, we live in a diverse country. Isn't that pleasant to have someone who's tattooed like that so that you can feel diverse and cool? Uh, my whole department is diverse. It's like a little United Nations. They yeah, but can, okay, great, fine. Can they do the job, though, or they just come there to look good? Right now, she's got a miniature drone, and she's sending over, she's got attached to this drone <laughs> paperwork that she's sending over to this young kid who um, he's got her, I, I don't even right, I don't understand what you're saying. So she's good at what she does? It sounds to me like she's pretty advanced if she's using a drone. It's, it's a drunken chaos, but they... Yeah, but why doesn't she just email the drawing instead of, instead of sending it by a drone? Because they're, it's more, it's liberal, it's more like a party here. It's okay, so what you're saying is they're into having fun. And whatever the latest trend is, they're jumping on it. But they're not really doing their job even in your ad agency. Is that more or less what you're saying? I'm saying, yes. I'm saying if you walked in here and I told you that these people were, were ad men and they're working on a project... You would you would laugh at me. You would say that it couldn't be. And then I You mean it's chaotic like a kindergarten with children who are running amok without any organization and without anyone supervising them. I bet they don't listen to anything you say to them, right? N nothing whatsoever. So they ignore you. Is that one of the reasons you're mad at them? Well, I'm not really mad at them because I get I get paid pretty good, but what they've so wait a minute. How do you keep your job if they're all different than you and they don't listen to you? What do you do? They, believe it or not, they they hit it out of the park for me. I don't know how they do it. Oh, well, oh, wait a minute. See now, now you're saying something different. You're saying that they're different than you. They're freak show. They're like a, like a Bringling Brothers freak show. They're young maniacs. She's tattooed to death. And yet they hit it out of the park. They produce good work. So that's the end. The end result is what the owners care about and the client rather, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they, don't, they don't. Right, So in a way, you know, your argument sort of doesn't hold water. What you're saying is you don't like their lifestyle, but they're very creative kids. All right, I'll tell you something. I'm going to send you countdown to Mecca so you can put it on your desk and really cause a stir. Stay in a line. 18 minutes after the hour. Here's an email. <clears throat> I went in the Barnes & Noble bookstore here in Pensacola, Florida, just off the naval base, to order your book, Countdown in Mecca, and it was nowhere to be found. I asked the B&N clerk, some lady, if they had it in stock or if they sold out, and she said, the publisher of the book specifically requested your book, Countdown to Mecca, is not to be available in the Pensacola Barnes & Noble. I told her that seemed highly irregular. And she said, well, it is what it is, and gave me a dirty look. So I guess I'll order online. That comes from Sanford B. in Pensacola. If you are having similar experiences in bookstores, I'm serious now. You can send them to savageanswers at gmail.com, which was set up for another reason. Savageanswers at gmail.com. I will forward them to the publisher. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Hey, our Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. The only company I trust for wealth insurance, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. I thought this was either Bono or uh, the other one I mentioned, the guy from England, the gay guy man, in the Lincoln bedroom. I don't remember his name with the piano. Or it does sound like Billy Joel, but it isn't. It's a group called Foreigner. I never heard of them, but I heard the song in a car. So it's a funny thing, the last caller from the ad agency in Detroit who called, right? And he said, complaining about the kids at work for him. They're like lunatics, and he's using a drone, and he's got, and they got tattoos, and they're a maniac. And he only says, I said, so this and that. He says, well, <laughs> they're doing a job. They knock it out of the park for me. So what, what was the point it was called? Then, then Robert, my board op, says to me, wait a minute. They're working, and he is calling a national talk show at work? So, so I was screwing up. It was an interesting call. I kept him on longer than normal. You know that I wanted to hit the kill button because he wasn't talking fast enough for me, right? But as we, as I listened, I heard something under the undertone. I realized there might be something in that call. So there it is. That's all. Next case. Move it along. Line two. Frank, WABC. What's on your mind? Yeah, uh, Michael, I heard you say that uh, many liberals are from the 60s and are running the government at this time, and they don't know their left foot from their right foot, and they don't even know how to run a funeral parlor in the room. 
You know, uh, I grew up in uh, northwestern Queens here in New York City, across across uh, Manhattan by the East River. And I, we have a very, very liberal congresswoman here. And uh, I... Uh, well, well, who's your congresswoman? Ne- Neil Lowry? Carolyn Maloney. Oh, Carolyn the phony. Uh-huh. And I, I, I listen to you carefully, and I assume that maybe there are some Republican conservatives who grew up in the same time period who are running for president right now, and I think maybe uh, they can actually uh, state the, the liberal policies that... There was nothing wrong with anyone growing their hair long and experimenting with various things in the 60s if they were young, uh, embracing the politics of the time, and then changing with time and becoming a full human being 10, 15, 20 years later. The problem is with the psychos who got stuck in the 60s as though they were prehistoric animals that fell into a pit of amber. That's the problem with the 60s mentality. Obama is espousing all the filth of the 60s as though it's something fresh and new. It almost destroyed the country then. It's almost destroying the country now. The man is like a primitive creature that, got f- that fell into a pit of amber. That's the whole point that I'm saying. Well, Michael, is, is there? A, is, can you fumigate this? Because I'm, I'm. Pretty- I can't fumigate it ex- ex- other than by exposing it. I went through the '60s. I had long hair. I was a man who was a plant collector. I took the best modalities of the '60s and I channeled it into something productive. I studied medicine from the alternative medical side. I studied homeopathy. I studied nutrition. I studied homo- um, uh, botanical medicine. I earned two master's degrees and a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. I searched the world for healing plants. So I didn't just move through the '60s like an observer. I incorporated all the newness of the 60s in my being, and as I evolved, I realized my politics needed to evolve with me. And as I saw what life was doing to me and what liberalism was doing to me in the country, I became more and more conservative. Write it down. That's a full message. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It is your happy uh, talk show host, Michael Savage. I'm in a manic mood today. Tomorrow will be another story. Tomorrow will be uh, Curry Tuesday with a collapse. Uh, I'm working on the new male ideal of the pudgy body. I'm eating a piece of eggplant parmesan with chopped garlic on it during the break. It's unbelievable. I don't even care what's in it anymore. I just scrape the cheese off it. It's so good, it's frightening. And I'm not selling it to you. KSFO Online, Gene, welcome. What's on your mind? Go ahead, please. Rush Limbaugh is the Oprah Winfrey of the GOP. I love you, Dr. Savage. That was wonderful. No, I, I didn't say he is. I said, has Rush Limbaugh become the Oprah Winfrey of the Republican Party? The thought and the concept, I was just, just overwhelming. I, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I have to listen to one of that, that, that crew talk about the Republicans as though they're the, the Holy Grail and the Democrats are the devil. I can't take it anymore. I've listened to it for 20 years. Look where we are today as a result. And remember, I was not invited to the White House by George Bush. Limbaugh was. So was Hannity. So were other uh, cronies of the Limbaugh cartel. They were fed it at the White House. I was not. I've been an independent from the beginning, and I'm proud of it. But I'm not going to sit here and say to you that John McCain is the answer to the Republicans' salvation of America, because that's what they're saying. If you're going to push the Republican Party ideal, then you're pushing the same old, same old, same old. Anyway, I didn't mean to talk about that. What's on your mind, Gene? Well, the same concept. It's not the Republican Party. It's it's a concept of a conservative uh, uh, grouping, which is why people, I think, liberals hate or love, uh, hate you and, and love madmen. They feel as though that Don Draper, who was sort of a, I don't know, a, a good-looking Woody Allen. He was a flawed man, uh, just stumbling through, but really wanted, he wanted that white picket fence and the little family and whatnot. That was really what he wanted to go through. But they tried to drag him through and show how his uh, ambition, you know, it hurt women, it hurt minorities. uh, uh. But the same liberals who have an autistic sensibility who love madmen, if they didn't buy into the propaganda about Michael Savage would love me the way they love madmen. They don't know who I am. They never listen to this show. But they heard because I oppose gay marriage, I'm I'm the devil himself. They heard that because I oppose the lie of global warming, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm an ignoramus. Go down the list. It's all based on prejudice. 
not reality. Well, you, you can't win an argument with a stupid person. And so when you, when you argue with liberals, it's, it's, uh, you can't expect Let me explain to... something. The next time you encounter a, a, a moron who won't listen to reason, no matter what you show them about the devil in the White House and what he's doing and the liar that he is, they won't listen to you. They won't believe you. You know what you say to them? You know, my friend, a person wants to find hell as a place where there is no reason. You are living in a hell. I'm leaving. Goodbye. That's what I've done. I've done that. You don't have to scream and yell and call them names. If they want to live in a self-imposed hell where there is no reason, just tell them that's where they're living and take a walk. That's it. What's on your mind in addition to this? I just uh, I wanted to say also, if you would, if you could put up a pay site somehow that we could listen to you on demand, because I miss the fact that there used to be a seven-day archive that I could be... Uh, uh, I know. I you know. I'm actually working on something else along those lines, which will be separate from the radio show, where it'll be Michael Savage Uncensored, where you can subscribe to it, because I'm too constrained, frankly, uh, for what I really want to say. If you actually heard me rage against the machine, I think you'd really understand that you're getting the tip of the iceberg on the show. But I would enjoy it, and I jones for it. Oh, you'd enjoy it, all right. Yeah, I can guarantee a lot of people would enjoy the real Michael Savage. It's not too far from what you're listening to. This is the mild version. Uh, you're getting a free copy of Countdown to Mecca. Stay on the line, 855-407-282. Let's go to KKOB Radio. Rudy, go ahead, please. You're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Michael, I was uh, really concerned about this country, especially race relations. My first um, indication that there was race problems in this country was when I was a, a young teenager in Southern California. My parents were talking about the black Muslims and all the hate they were fomenting at that time. This is like maybe the early 60s, mid-60s. And further on from there, I remember... Um, uh, the race hate, uh, the race uh, vileness that uh, Charles Manson was espousing. He was uh, mm -hmm. want, wanting to start a race war. Right. Just wondering uh, how, what he would think of Obama right now. It's been awful, Michael. I'm, well, the I, rhetoric of Obama and Sharpton and Holder is not too far from that of Charles Manson and Manson's vision of stirring up the black population to conduct a race war. It, even as near as this weekend... <clears throat> Despite the epidemic of killings of police, the devil in the White House went out and attacked the police again. Did you hear that today? Play it again. No one believed that he did this. He did it. He did it again. The Satan did it again. That sense of unfairness and powerlessness has helped to fuel the kind of unrest that we've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson and New York. It has many causes, from a basic lack of opportunity to groups feeling unfairly targeted by police. Do you realize what a lie that is? Do you realize he's justifying the, the looting? He's justifying the burglary that triggered some of this? He's justifying the killing of the police? The very same Satan who just said that, so far as I know, has not apologized for what he did in Ferguson and what he did in Baltimore. Instead, the, the, the Satan is doubling down on fomenting ra racial hatred, in my opinion. I think that's what you're saying, is that not? Absolutely, Michael. I'm just a working class dude in a... How could a president continue to push such hatred? The rhetoric is no different, by the way, than that of Al Sharpton or of the Grand Wizard of the who? Clue who am I talking about? Who's the Grand Wizard of race hatred in America? The Black Panthers. And who's the number two... Uh, wizard, grand wizard of racial hatred in America, the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam has been putting out this hatred for 35 or 40 years. The Black Panthers have been putting out for 35 or 40 years. The rhetoric of Obama is not much different than, their, than theirs. It's getting real scary, Michael. It's very scary. Uh, he did something else over the weekend. In addition to doubling down and attacking the police and justifying the thugs in the streets, he also demilitarized the U.S. police departments, taking away weapons they had from the U.S. military. And at the same time, he has militarized the military in the United States of America. What is he getting ready for? Many people are very concerned that he's preparing for something astro astronomically unbelievable. And he'll get away with it unless the people see it coming. Michael, he's, he's uh, armed the TSA. There's his thugs. There's his jackbooted thugs. His brown shirts. And, and they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And they have weapons. They're weaponized, Michael. He, so oh, you, you are, Rudy, you're really freaked out over this guy, worse than I think. I've seen it, Michael. I've seen it. I'm, I'm 67 years old. I'm your, one of your contemporaries. I've seen everything. 
And it's, it's gotten to a point where it's scary. It's scary. I have grandchildren that live in these urban areas. I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid that they're going to get jumped, beat on the head, just because they're white. It's awful. How can you say a thing like that? As you well know, uh, the people of color are all downtrodden and oppressed. They don't do things like that. They just do it when they have justifiable rage. They would never pick on an innocent uh, person of none color. Michael, I saw Watts. I was there. I was driving right through the town, uh, going to a Dodgers game on my motorcycle the night before it happened. I saw the Rodney King riots. I saw, I've saw. i seen it all in L.A. And you hear the president pushing more rioting. Isn't that what you're saying? Exactly. He's, he's not Listen to what this slick Satan said again and again and again. Satan didn't say this a year ago before the riots. Satan didn't say this a year ago before there was a police an epidemic of killing police by minorities. By the way! Listen to what Satan said this weekend. That sense of unfairness and powerlessness has helped to fuel the kind of unrest that we've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson. You and New lying, York. you liar. It has you. many causes. You from evil a basic liar. Lack of opportunity to both crap unfairly targeted by police. Liar. Unfairly targeted by police. You know, last night I watched the show about split second decisions that police have had to make over the years. It was super well done. It showed one woman, policewoman in Minneapolis, who had to respond to a call for a black man who was threatening his wife and daughter. Her partner got shot in the face. She had to do a shootout with the guy. She luckily shot him in the head and killed him after a shootout. The black family loved her because he, she saved their lives. She was white, by the way. Then there was another hero cop that was given an award in Southern California, a uh, 26-year veteran, Hispanic had to go to a situation where a Hispanic male was holding an Hispanic female who was pregnant with a gun to her head, and he took one shot after a yelling match with the uh, perpetrator and shot him one shot in the head and killed him. And he didn't want to do it. No, no, no. It's not about missed opportunities. It's about evil thugs who are using rhetoric like this to get away with virtual murder. That's my opinion. There's nothing about failed opportunities because if it was true, Barack Obama never would have gotten where he got. If this country was as racist as Obama says it was, how do you explain that he's president? If uh, the country was as racist as he says it was, how in the hell did Al Sharpton wind up where he is? Shall I go down the list? How did Oprah Winfrey get where she is if there's no opportunity? It's all a big lie. White guilt. It's, a, it's a horrible thing to watch. I would expect this from a low-grade junior professor at Harvard University to get away with this kind of lie. But when you see this thin man who is clearly Satan himself pushing the same rhetoric after police are getting killed, you have to ask yourself, when in the world will this country finally stand up and demand that he stop it and be required to apologize to the police for this uh, epidemic of police killings? It's sickening, Rudy. It's very, very dangerous. Thanks for the call. I don't want to get more agitated than I am. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let's say you're a millennial and you have no idea what you're listening to. You're listening to the truth, the simple truth, the God's honest, simple truth of what's going on in your country. And I want to remind you that other countries have fallen while the sky was blue and the clouds were white. Dance parties went on. Lawns were planted. Babies were born. Grandparents died. Uh, people went on vacations, people played sports, but you know, at the same time all that normal life was going on, there were evil men and women who were trying to destroy their societies, literally trying around the clock to destroy everything that was good about their country. Listen to this speech and tell me which side you think this man is on. Listen to it again. That sense of unfairness and powerlessness has helped to fuel the kind of unrest that we've seen in places like Baltimore. You and Ferguson, lying to and New York. It has many causes, from a basic lack of opportunity to groups liar. feeling unfairly targeted by liar, police. liar, liar. How could the police take this? Now I want to segue when I come back from the break into a book that came out that's not mine, entitled "The Double Life of Fidel Castro." It was written by Juan Ronaldo Sanchez, who was his personal bodyguard for 17 years. The man was a skilled assassin, a skilled martial artist in three different fields of martial arts, and he was Fidel's number one man. This explosive book will make your hair stand up because Castro lived a simple soldier's life in the public eye while leading a luxurious dictator's life in private. 
So why am I telling you about this? Why? Because he stole the entire country from the people. And he stole not only the people's freedom, but he stole all the money of the entire nation. How did he get away with it? Well, through terror, number one. And number two, because he had the most phenomenal propaganda machine in history uh, that the world had ever seen. They created the image of the simple man, but he wasn't the simple man. What this man says in this expose, in the, the revelation of the state secrets, are the many sides of Fidel Castro and how he got away with this, what he did to people. He mainly used a propaganda ministry of the type of propaganda machine that Obama has. Uh, you may not see the parallels immediately, but it's worth looking at, and I can't read the whole book to you. I'll read it to you, one paragraph. Few could surpass Fidel Castro in matters of disinformation. As the history books record, when American journalists secretly went to interview him in the mountains of the Sierra Mastra, the guerrilla fighter would mastermind the perfectly staged scene. This master of the art of illusion would make his soldiers move around every which way, and that in the background so as to create the impression of a mass of people making his interlocutors believe that his rebel troops were far more numerous than they really were. Well, he went on, after he conquered Cuba, to manipulating public imagery about himself later on in life. And so the people thought he was a simple soldier who led a quiet life. But according to this man, that's not true. They said he was an accomplice to drug traffickers, and his personal life was that of a king, not of a simple man. But moreover, that he stole the country from the Cuban people themselves. Now, what does it have to do with Obama? Everything and nothing. It has everything to do with Obama because he has a propaganda machine unlike anything I've ever seen since Germany in the 1930s. It is a seamless propaganda machine that was perhaps given away a little bit last week when we saw the story about George Staphylococcus uh, working with the Clintons. He's a Democrat plant, as is Chris Matthews and so many others. I'll go on when I return right here on The Savage Nation. Join The Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-Y-C-O-I-N. Well, uh, the old adage, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, hits home with Al Sharpton's daughter, who has a $5 million sprained ankle lawsuit against New York City. Dominique Sharpton, unfortunately for her and her wonderful father, posted pictures to Instagram showing she completed a difficult mountain climb in Bali, Indonesia, even though her $5 million sprained ankle lawsuit, lawsuit says that Sharpton Jr., still suffers debilitating pain after twisting her ankle in a street crack in Soho last year. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? Here's another one. A general, one of our best generals, a two-star Air Force general, a lifer, a great man, mentioned God at a National Day of Prayer, Day of Prayer Task Force speech. He mentioned God, and he said his ability to fly these planes is because of God. As a result of this, this vermin, Mickey Weinstein, who I believe should be found out. Look, I, I have such contempt for Mickey Weinstein, CEO of the Civil Liberties Group, the Freedom Military Religious Freedom Foundation. If you were looking for Satan in human form, a man by the name of Mickey Weinstein could be central casting in my estimation. He is demanding that Mark Welsh, the general, should be fired for mentioning God in a speech. You know, enough is enough. I'd like to see Delta Force visit Mickey Weinstein after hours and ask him why he hates God so much. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7282. Savage. Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised.
And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. Blue Monday, how I hear Blue Monday. Got to work, plan to sleep all deep. He'll come to me. Mad Men fans, that seems to be the number one topic for today, in addition to the political stuff, because Mad Men was sort of a political television melodrama that was extremely entertaining at times and extremely grating at times and boring at times. The ads drove me insane most of the time. And no, I'm not going to buy a Chrysler despite the ads, incidentally. The only Chrysler I ever owned that I liked was a Lincoln Town Car, and they stopped making them, so what's the good of it? But anyway, here we are. Questions. Al Sharpton's daughter sprained her ankle. She's suing the city for $5 million. You hear this? And then she films herself on Instagram after a mountain hike. Unbelievable what this world has become. We're talking about my book, Countdown to Mecca, and what you think of it. And many people love my character, Saul Minsky. We're talking about the real Fidel Castro and how he has more in common with Barack Obama than you may think. We have asked the question, do you believe the U.S. Army Delta Force really killed an ISIS chieftain captured his wife well if it's true and not just propaganda where are the pictures i mean you would think that since the military is trumpeting this great success even though another city has fallen to isis and of course this is just a propaganda stunt even if it's real it was just a propaganda mission by obama to show something good that he did as great commander-in-chief in between golfing and wrecking the country he hasn't stopped ISIS, has it? They're taking one city after another. They're raping their way across Iraq and Syria. They're destroying ancient archaeological sites that can make you weep if you understand what these vermin are doing. These vandals of the ages. The world should be outraged by what they're doing. Kidnapping, raping, pillaging, hurting children, cutting their heads off, and, and wrecking ancient art. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. So what? In the middle of this, Obama sends another impotent half measure. U.S. Army Delta Force goes in and allegedly, and I say allegedly because it looks like it could be Capricorn 1 to me. Who knows if it really happened? I, let's say it happened. Well, did it stop ISIS from their rampage? No. What we need is a massive mission of beef B-1 bombers raging around the clock where you hear them roaring overhead in America for 72 hours, for a week, for two weeks, where they're taking off from every air base in America, loaded with bombs, B-1 bombers, buzzing in the middle of the night, to wipe the vermin off the planet once and for all. Instead, we're just an impotent fool of a nation under a Satan in the White House who is more interested in destroying the domestic world than conquering the worst planet, the, the worst the planet has seen since Adolf Hitler. Only this time, Adolf is not speaking German, he's speaking Arabic. And this time he's not holding Mein Kampf, he's holding another book that he believes in. You get it? Okay, biker bloodbath in Texas. Waco gang fight. 170 arrested. All right, that's a problem. Terrible problem. Nothing more I can say about it. Headline, Drudge Report, Kerry calls for more internet laws, global system. No kidding. What else would a shallow, empty shell like Kerry want but a control of the media? Don't you understand what's at stake? I made a comparison in the last hour between Fidel Castro controlling his image, controlling the country through imagery, through propaganda, and Obama doing the same. So what do you think the gang that's running the world needs to do next in order to secure their grip on the heart of mankind? In addition to having planted the most bloodthirsty socialist pope imaginable, a bloodthirsty psychotic, by the way, I'll raise the stakes. This pope is not a religious figure at all. He is Karl Marx with a skull cap and a cloak. This pope is Karl Marx reincarnate. And this pope now says that Fidel Castro and Raul Castro are so wonderful that America should have relations with them. And Obama, of course, was waiting for that message. And Raul Castro, a terrorist for the last 45 years, has ruled that island like a, like a prison camp, stolen everything from the people. <clears throat> and we're told that Raul Castro himself, a diehard lifetime Marxist, said, this pope is so good that I'm thinking of going back to the Catholic Church. What does that tell you? 
At the same time, Obama continues to fan the flames of race, race warfare in America, giving a speech over the weekend. Again, justifying the thugs in Baltimore, the thugs in Ferguson, the thugs in New York City. Again, attacking the police while police are being killed around the country. There is a pattern, but it takes a long, long study to understand the pattern. KSFO, Jim, go ahead, please. Fire away. What's, what's on your mind? When I get off, we'll order one. Hold on. You still there? Jim. Yes. Jim. Hey, Mike. Um, here's what we need to do in America. We need to develop a zero-tolerance policy for tyranny because Frederick Douglass said in 1862, the levels of a tyrant are prescribed by the endurance of those that they oppress. The reason the tyrant in the White House is doing what he is able to get away with is because we have tolerated... There's no more quotes. People can't take it in. So what do you want the people to do? to expose Satan in the White House. What more can I do other than call him Satan and expose every day what Satan is doing? What more do you want me to do? Mike, you're doing everything. I admire you for what you're doing. I pray for your safety every day. Well, so do I. I play, pray for my safety every day as well. I know what a gangster is in the White House, and I know what a gang is running the world. And I understand when I see a pope and Castro and Obama on the same page, we're really in trouble. We are, Mike. And you know what, but there are people that are out here that are trying... I understand, but we're all powerless. You may not know it, but we are powerless. I could lie to you and tell you you have all the power. We are powerless in the face of this monstrosity called the Obama administration. I don't want to say any more, Jim, because it'll sound like I'm Obama bashing, which is almost a redundancy. Michael Savage, Countdown to Mecca, just out last week, last in the series. I'll send it out to you. You'll be getting it in the mail real soon. 855-407-282. WMAL Perry, you've been holding a long time on the Castro bodyguard story. Perry, welcome to the program. Make your point, please. Yes, I, I just, you had said something, though, that I have to um, make a comment on. Uh, you said something about the nature of Islam, 30, 35 years of hatred. First of all, the nature of Islam is 85 years old. And second of all, I wouldn't be a part of anything that resembles hatred or uh, purpose. Well, but your boss, or whatever his name is, I forget his name, I, I can't remember, Louis Farrakhan, doesn't he spew hatred for the Jews almost every time he gives a speech? He does not. You know why? Because you cannot be... He does a not? I've played his speeches on this show where he calls the Jew the devil. All right, first of all... No. First of all, when you say something, it's funny. When something is said of truth in a strong way, it's it's it's, it's canceled. So you just said that he said the Jews are the devil. You say that that's the truth. He did not say the Jews are the devil. And you yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did on many occasions. He says it every time he can, just like Adolf Hitler did, in order to um, turn the Jew into the scapegoat. Your boss does the same thing. I don't care how many bow ties you wear. You're still full of hatred. Okay, well, okay, that's your, your Your whole religion, your whole religious orientation is built on hating everybody else. It's not. It's not, sir. With all due respect... You show me where in the nation of Islam you say that you could be the brother of Jews and Christians. Show it to me. I, I, I can show you, and I can pull up a clip at another time. Matter of fact, I'll email it to you. He had said that if any Jew... Now, one thing he said, one, was he told us as the fruit of Islam, if you see anybody desecrating a Jewish synagogue... It is our duty to defend that house where God... Made. I'm glad to hear it. Then why don't you defend it against the, the, the people who are calling Jews the devil, like your boss? And, and number two, he said... No, no, don't give me number two. I have the speeches. Over the years, he has been the most vile anti-Semite since Adolf Hitler. I admit it that he has a nice bow tie, and he has a, a gang of uh, bodyguards that are quite intimidating, but that doesn't take away from what he's saying. And we're going to argue about this, and you're going to say he didn't say it. I'm going to say he did say it. The point is he is full of hatred, not love. He does not espouse the Christian belief in brotherhood. He espouses the hatred for everyone except Muslims. That's all. I don't even want to talk about that. WVNN Radio, David, go ahead. Fire away. You're on the Savage Nation. What's on your mind? Yes, I just wanted to speak about the general situation, okay? I, you know, I don't want listen to watch a lot of TV. But I just want to say that MSNBC is good TV.
TV if you want to clarify all of the garbage that we hear. I don't know what you're talking about. Give me one example of anything they say that's rational and real. Your listening audience, Lawrence O'Donnell, okay? Perfect. He's a communist. He hates America. He espouses nothing but hatred. He's a phony white man. Makes believe he's on the side of blacks and Hispanics and the downtrodden when he's cashing in on the machine. So what are you talking about? You're buying his garbage? You see, it's good TV. When in the world has he ever shown to be real? The man is a loser. He has no audience. Listen, so all you're, doing, all you're doing is calling to push a television uh, outlet that has no audience. They're bleeding audience. They have no following, David. Well, I, I, other, than, I, other, than peop, other than people like you who lack any education or knowledge. You're the only people who would watch MSNBC. I mean, admittedly, if you have no education or knowledge and you hate America, that's the, uh, the destination for you on the channels. I, I agree with you. That's definitely the place for the ignoramuses to go. They feel very much at home. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. Today we're also releasing new policies on the military-style equipment that the federal government uh, has in the past provided to state and local law enforcement agencies. You know, we've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like there's an occupying force as opposed to a force that's part of the community that's protecting them and serving them. Double can alienate and intimidate local residents and send the wrong message. So we're going to prohibit some equipment made for the battlefield that is not appropriate for local police departments. But your thugs, your rotten, stinking inner-city thugs who are burning cities to the ground, you haven't disarmed them, have you? You false Satan, you! So he's disarming the police. He is encouraging the thugs in the inner cities. He is fomenting civil war. I wrote a book, Stop the Coming Civil War. This gangster is not finished. He's just gearing up for the final assault. Trust me, what he has done over the weekend is astonishingly clear to those of us who study these things. He ended long-running federal transfers of some combat-style gear to local law enforcement in order to ease tensions between police and minority communities? Did he say we're going to go into the inner cities and take away the AK-47s? We'll break down doors if necessary to take the damn weapons out of the gang's hands! Did he say we're going to do it in Baltimore? We're going to do it in Ferguson? We're going to do it in New York? We're going to do it in Oakland? We're going to take the weapons back from the gangsters? And then we'll talk about what the police may or may not need? No. Which side did, it, did he disarm first? He disarmed the police first. Why? Why does he want state and local police agencies to be weaker at the same time he is encouraging more civil unrest? How does he get away with this? How do the police unions kowtow to this evil man? I know how, because he buys them off. The top brass in the police department, the top brass in the police unions, kowtow to the federal government because they get paid off. They get big pensions, they get big pay, big, pay, big visits, big, big medals. They get invited to the White House to meet uh, the contingent of police haters. And they think that they're getting something for their money. They're getting nothing but the death of themselves, the death of the police in America. So listen to what he just did. How did he do this? He did it by executive order. He's counting the police as he's, he's saying the police are responsible for black deaths around the country without saying which blacks are dying and why they're dying. It makes it sound like the police are going out hunting black people. He doesn't talk about crime. He talks only about crimes of police. Even when there are no crimes of the police, he makes it sound as though they're committing crimes just by doing their police work. So now he takes away their weapons, and he doesn't take away the weapons of the gangs. How is that possible? How is it possible that he gets away with this? The issue of police militarization is a big one. Both right and left have commented that they're frightened of this. Many of you on the right do not like the idea of a militarized police, fearing that they could come after you with the same weapons. Well, that's another question for another time. But Obama didn't talk about that. 
He didn't say that armed citizens uh, are worried about the police. He said gangs are worried about the police. And then they put out the big lie. A white police officer in Ferguson fatally shot unarmed black 18-year-old Michael Brown. Again, repeating the big lie. Michael Brown was a criminal. Michael Brown was a thug. Michael Brown beat up a small Indian shopkeeper. Stole things from his store. Michael Brown, the thug, got what he deserved. Michael Thug was fighting with a cop trying to steal his gun and kill him. And the cop killed Michael Brown. Thank God for the cop's strength and guts. But again, the Associated Press repeats the big lie. White police officer at Ferguson fatally shot unarmed black 18-year-old Michael Brown sparking protests. They said, why did the police occur, uh, show up in full body armor with armored trucks? to dispel demonstrators. Well, if the cop were you, or your father, or your brother, or your husband, or your wife, do you want them to walk into a mob without body armor? Because that's what that moron prosecutor did in Maryland. She disarmed the police, and look at what we saw. We saw thugs, inner city thugs, throwing stones at police who were there without helmets, running away from thugs, street thugs. It was nauseating to watch this. It was sickening. My stomach turned. Inner city thugs who don't work, don't go to school, God knows what they do, living on public assistance, throwing stones and rocks at the police in Baltimore, and the police retreated because they didn't have body armor, because they didn't have armored cars, Mr. Obama. That's why Baltimore burned. My friends, this is a very dangerous time. We have Satan in the White House. Satan has now disarmed the police and encouraged the thugs in the inner cities. This is the worst day I have ever seen in, in, in contemporary times in terms of an upside-down, topsy-turvy world, and barely has it been mentioned on radio or television. I'm glad you could listen. This is the Savage Nation. Now go check out Countdown to Mecca, and you'll see what I really think. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Let's play the sound to Mad Men for a moment on the Savage Nation. It's a series on A&E that ended. Love it. Love the opening. Now, I, I've been captivated by this show from the beginning. I loved it for many years, then I didn't like it. I liked it best when January Jones was a skinny, vampy twin for some of the great, let's say, sirens in the history of film. Once they turned her into a sow living in Westchester with a, a Republican uh, congressman, or I don't know what he was, an attorney general, I don't know what, I, don't, I lost interest in her when she became fat and sat in the house. Okay, and I liked when she was in the house originally with Don, with the two children, it was the original America that we all grew up with, the little New York, uh, you know, the dream of America. Mother, father, children, house, picket fence. And what really went on? I mean, he was a runaround lunatic. The seventh season ended last night. Some say it was among the best in TV history. I wouldn't say so. The Sopranos are still number one. Of course, many of the same incredible uh, <clears throat> film people who created The Sopranos created Mad Men, in case you don't know that. Matthew Weiner, for example, used to write many of the episodes of The Sopranos. Many of the cinematographers, producers, directors who worked on The Sopranos worked on this, and I saw overlap, like a dance scene last night of a guy of them skating through an empty house. Okay, fine. Let's say it was one of the best TV shows in history. But what is it really about? Well, for those of you who watched it, you know what it's about. Mad Men is not just the story of Don Draper and January Jones's character. It, Don was a womanizing ad exec. He couldn't keep his hand off any woman, no matter who it was. A uh, soccer team of the daughter, uh, the babysitter, neighbor. The guy was an all-around DB. And he has a, a, a hidden past. Changed his name, shot his commanding officer in Korea. You know, horrible background. Good-looking, uh, ad like uh, ad man type of uh, Madison Avenue. But what the show is really about is the weird transformation that America went through in the 1960s. That's the real story of the show. It's why many of us were captivated by it, because we've lived through it. We went from the 1950s, where things were stable. America was all powerful. We had Pax Americana. Everything was American. Everyone wanted to be in America. All of a sudden, the degenerates like Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, 
and the lawyer, the lawyer who went down south to run the uh, the uh, anti-racism marches, I forget the lawyer's name, the three of them plus a few of the uh, early feminists, Betty Friedan and the other DBs, uh, delayed broadcasters, they destroyed America. They single-handedly destroyed America. And our post-war optimism went to pot. Marijuana had a big, big, big role in the destruction of America, as it is right now. And everybody lost their minds. The whole country lost their minds. Everyone became crazy. Dark decade, civil unrest, mustaches, bell bottoms, underarm hair for women, patchouli oil, uh, STDs became rampant. And so last night it ended, the, the show ended. And it ends with him at Esalen. <laughs> for those of you who didn't know the setting, it was up in Mater uh, uh, Carmel area on a bluff with everyone going ohm and sitting around with the phony guru and all of that. And Don had run away from the ad business, as many people in the ad business did in, the, in that era. They all were running away. They wanted to find themselves and write the great novel. Some of them did. Most of them didn't. Uh, Don goes to the cliffside, and he does ohm, and he meditates. He finds himself. He starts to cry on another man's arm. I thought I was going to end in a gay scene with him running off with the bald guy, frankly. I was thanking God it didn't. When he hugged the bald guy, I was crying. I said, oh, God, no, please. Matthew, don't do this to us. But no, no, it ends with the Coca-Cola ad. So you're supposed to believe that after Don, who ran away from advertising, gave away his Cadillac to a bum hitchhiking on the road and finds himself in Essel and crying on a bald guy's shoulder, after Don finds himself with the belief he goes back to Madison Avenue with the greatest new campaign in history for Coca-Cola called We Are the World. In other words, he co-opted the hippie movement. That's, you know, that's the subtext of it. And what is the theme of Mad Men, and why should it, you listen to this? What, what was the appeal of that? It's basically about the loss of innocence of individuals and America and the downward fall of its main characters. Isn't it about that? So in the beginning, uh, early years of the show, heavy on popular jazz, crooners, standards, youth culture, rock and roll, burst onto the scene later on with Chubby Checkers, Let's Twist, and Let's Twist Again. That ushered in season two. Then there was another cultural sea change, the arrival of psychedelia, um, LSD, psy psilocybin, mushrooms, uh, marijuana, symbolized in episode eight of season five of the Beatles, and uh, on and on. So music is a very big part of, of the show, the verse music selection, and it really is important to understand that. As much as it was important in The Sopranos, and as music is important to my show, incidentally, I would say Michael Savage's talk show has music as a central theme. Behind the scene, there's music. I send messages through my music. Did you know that? But what do you, what do you think about Mad Men? Did anyone watch it? Am I talking about something you'd rather not hear about? The news out there is so horrendous right now. So I'm going to give you the news. Here's a nice little story in all you American Red-blooded Americans, Rock River Republicans. Here it comes. Girl Scouts welcome cross-dressing boys into their ranks. Isn't that nice? Now, that's very inclusive. The Girl Scouts of America is the latest organization to cave to pressure from the LGBTIQA lobby to extend membership to boys who identify as girls. How do you like that? I just can't believe this. By the way, people are calling now on the book uh, Countdown to Mecca with all sorts of reports that they can't get the book here, they can't get the book there. It's a great book. I may be, This is the last day I'm going to talk about it. It's not that I've given up on it. It's enough already. You want to buy it, buy it. You don't want to buy it, don't buy it. I hope you buy it. It's a great book. It's the last of the trilogy. It will be a collector's item. And for those of you who have abuse of power and uh, a time for war, this is it. It's the uh, trilogy. Now, of course, you all want to talk about someone else. and You want to talk about George Staphylococcus who is now as toxic as a bacterium. George Staphylococcus, too glib to fail. Be stolen before it leaves my breath. Guarantee you that before it leaves my breath, it will be on other shows. But you heard it here first, because nobody can turn a phrase or a name faster than I, Michael Savage. So, you know, the George Staphylococcus story, who I'm, he's too glib to fail. They're not firing him. There's an embarrassment here, not only for him, of course, but... Did you ever think he was not a Democrat operative? Did you ever think that a goodly percentage of those in the media are Democrat operatives? With a few on the other side, by the way. 
I mean, if you look at, what's his name, the guy who looks like an SA officer with glasses on Fox News who worked for Bush, Bush's brain, uh, Carl Rung, Carl Jung, what's his name, Carl Rove, Carl Rove, Carl Rove, Carl Rove, of course, is a, is a Republican political operative. All right, there's a difference, I get it. You know he's a political operative when he speaks. That's why, you know, that's why there's a scandal, because George Staphylococcus didn't disclose he gave money to the Clintons. Now, and the question is, what did he want for the money? Uh, what do I know? Access, who knows what he wanted. Uh, I don't know what he wanted, but, I mean, George Staphylococcus, you know that's going to stick. It's over now. I have a way with names. Sometimes I name a media person or a politician something, and that's it for the rest of their career. I don't, I'm not going to get worked up over George Staphylococcus like it's the most important story. Big deal. Big deal. You know he's going to go on. He's too glib to fail. ABC's not firing him. Who's the guy with the yellow uh, dyed hair on MSNBC who was always a Democrat operative? The one who felt the thrill. The, the guy who felt the thrill go up his leg when Obama became president. I, an embarrassment. Yeah, that guy Chris, the drunk on. What, I know his name. I didn't want to mention his name. But I'm saying it's filled with hacks. The media is filled with hacks who are working for one party or the other. And by the way, while we're talking about George Staphylococcus and him giving money to the to the Clinton Library, I'm sorry, you know, look, how do you feel about talk show hosts who continuously have Republican candidates on in the form of Plagola? I mean, are they did, should they disclose they're going to vote for that person? I, I felt uncomfortable about this for years. I even complained about it once. You notice I rarely have any guests on this show who are politicians, almost never. Did you notice that? There's a reason for it. The reason is, is that if I have a continuous stream of Republican uh, candidates on my show, how am I different than George uh, uh, Staphylococcus? And frankly, I think it's a violation of FCC rules, if you want to know the truth. I mean, if you have a stream, let's say you're a lib and you're on the media, in, in, in the medium, one of the mediums, whatever it may be, and you have Dems on all the time, is that not a form of plugola? You're plugging a candidate for free. Shouldn't they pay for that time? Same on the other side of the aisle. So, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about a rotten system from the top to the bottom. The George Stephanopoulos, who I'm calling George Staphylococcus story, I say he's too glib to fail. They're not going to get rid of him. Next case. They're not getting rid of him. That's that simple. Did they get rid of O'Reilly with the last scandal? No. There's certain media figures that are going to be around no matter what happens. I'm a media figure. I'm still around. People have tried to shaft me and destroy me. They still do. The book is out, Countdown to Mecca. And the customer reviews on Amazon are really strong. They're nice. And the trolls are running already. The trolls are running with reviews. They don't even read the book. They put me down, calling me names. They don't even read the book. This is what happens. The left-wing trolls, they're jealous of my success. They're jealous of the genius that emanates from my mouth every day. They can't shine my shoes, by the way, most of them. But the people like me, that's all. Here's one. This was an excellent read. I highly recommend this book. You almost don't need caffeine because your adrenaline level will be up there. Walter Winslow writes, Dak the Savage is a great writer, and this book is a page burner. Uh, another one says, this is a new category for me, and I'm liking it, though. This is my first foray into conservative talk show host novels since it's new. I'm not even near finished. I'm used to self-help novels, so this is heavy for my mind, but it's clear to me it's worth it. It's stimulating my imagination. I appreciate the efforts that Mr. Savage makes on air and in the literary world. Here's another one. Very unpredictable and fast reading. Here's another one by Jen. A must read. Great book. Love all of Savage's books. Another one. Brilliance. Brilliant. Couldn't put it down. On and on. It's all there. Forget the trolls. They're everywhere. You know, anytime anyone who loves America puts anything out, the vermin put out attacks. And we're talking about my latest novel, Countdown to Mecca, which is the third in a trilogy in the last of its series. That's it. Now let's move on. The only calls I'm getting on this sterling broadcast of mine, which I don't mind, I like it, is on Mad Men. And I don't blame people. They don't want to talk about Sharpton's daughter twisting her ankle and suing the city for four and a half million dollars and then showing herself on top of a mountain after a hike. She's probably using the same filthy, dirty lawyer that Sharpton used to, to rip the, the city off for all these years. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com, the only company I trust to protect my wealth with gold and silver. Here's a 
many other stories because they just hammer you with Republican this, Republican Democrat that, blah, 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 blah. and I think we ought to now play the race baiter himself because the day wouldn't be complete unless you understood that while you were partying over the weekend or golfing, whatever you do, the devil in the White House was putting out more racial unrest and hatred uh, around the clock from his microphone deep in the bowels of the White House. Listen to what the divider-in-chief said in clip eight. That sense of unfairness and powerlessness has helped to fuel the kind of unrest that we've seen in places like Baltimore and Ferguson liar. and you New liar. York. You liar. As many causes, from a basic lack of opportunity to you groups liar. feeling unfairly targeted by police. See, again. The police are dying, and he's saying to them, kill them again. You think I'm going to mince words? I'm not. This man is the devil. I'm convinced Obama is the devil. If there is a devil, let's put it to you this way. If there's a mythical devil, he's it. Smooth talk. He's Satan. The man may as well be Satan. Why do I say a thing like that on a national broadcast? Why? Because I believe it's true. But I don't actually believe there's a Satan. I believe that there's an evil socialist, communist, anti-American, especially anti-European American man in the White House with a wife who's worse than he is. And I think that they do everything they can around the clock to foster hatred between the races. Moreover, I'll go a step further. How is it that a criminal like Al Sharpton, a degenerate race hater, Ghana of the lowest order, who has a daughter who says she twisted her ankle and is suing New York for four and a half million dollars, and then she's filmed on top of a mountain hiking. How is it that that degenerate lowlife is invited into the White House 40 times and these empty suits in the, in the uh, media don't say a word? about Al Sharpton, a criminal, degenerate race hater, in my opinion, invited in and out of the White House. Forget what you think of Al Sharpton. I want you to imagine if a right-winger had won the presidency, and shortly after winning, he started inviting the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in and out of the White House for 50 times. Do you think, do you think that George Staphylococcus would have let him get away with that? Do you think that George Staphylococcus, who's too glib to fail, would have not commented on the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan coming in and out of the White House had a conservative won the presidency? You betcha. Do you think that that phony Irishman, John McCain, would be sitting there like the phony he is day in and day out, peddling the military-industrial complex while doing nothing about ISIS? Do you think Nancy Pelosi who has capitalized on the unrest in America. Do you think Dianne Feinstein, who sits on a Senate Intelligence Committee, will be sitting like the Queen of Diamonds herself, capitalizing on the unrest in America, letting ISIS rage across the Middle East and get up there today like the Queen of Diamonds and say, oh, we must do something to stop ISIS, like she just discovered it, in the middle of selling as many products as she could around the globe. If you get a comment on any of these topics, the phone number is 855-407-282. It's only Monday. I don't mean to upset you. I mean to awaken you. And it's a funny thing. Of all these topics that I introduced, people are calling about two topics only, mainly. They're calling about uh, Mad Men, and then they're calling about the dad bod. Because, look, it's the pebble in the shoe, television and uh, sex. That's what people are interested in. Now, I've known this for years, by the way, is that women really don't like macho warriors as much as you would think. It's what the uh, imagery in the television would have you believe. Number one, men who are into that body shape, you know, the perfect abs, and every minute they're looking at themselves and exercising, they're, co they're in competition with the woman, and she doesn't need another chick in the house uh, competing for mirror space. Let's put it to you that way. That doesn't mean she needs a blob running around, but we're talking about something in between. And then I read the article about the dad bod, why they're more uh, practical and less Darwinian. And they say we don't need a perfectly sculpted guy standing next to us to make us feel worse. <laughs> Our bodies, softer bodies make better cuddlers. But a lot of guys get frightened at age 30 because they think, oh, God, look at that. No matter what I do, there's a little belly fat. Oh, God, look at that, the gray hair. Oh, God, this, oh, God. Let it happen. You know what I'm saying? Do the best you can and stop eating your heart out already. First, you're not going to live forever. That's number one. And number two, you're not going to look like Adonis at 50. In fact, the harder you work out at 30, the worse you look at 60.